Hey everyone, it's finally happening. The first GeForce RTX embargo is up, so I can actually say that yes, I do have both of the initial RTX cards in my possession. I do finally have drivers and demo software, but today what I'm allowed to talk about is, well, I can actually show you the cards. I can physically take them out of the box in the phenomenon that I believe is referred to as an unboxing video. And uh, yes, I always find these rather dull, but to spice things up a bit, I am allowed to talk about the Turing architecture and some of the fascinating uh, enhancements that have been made to the GeForce architecture here. Let's begin uh, initially by taking a look at the GeForce RTX 2080. So I have broken the seals to make this whole thing a lot easier and uh, Whoa, <laughs> I've got to admit, I have seen the cards, but I haven't quite seen them this close up. This is quite a unit. So that's basically uh, the first card, the RTX 2080. That's got an uh, interesting little tag here. Uh, just seems to be a serial number. Okay, fair enough. And it's got a protective plastic seal on it, which is making a lot of noise, which I'm going to remove now. So. Here we go. Man, that is noisy. Let's have a look at the card itself. A protective plastic sleeve over the RTX 2080 uh, livery there. I've got to say, this is a really well-built card. It's really quite meaty and heavy. Uh, the heat sink, you can kind of see all the fins in the top there, which is great. Uh, beyond that, um, well, all I can say is solid metal construction really looks quite impressive and looking at the rear here towards the ports what do we got uh, well you've probably seen this already but you know here it is in hand so we've got three display ports hdmi 2.0 and yes we've got usb-c there which are virtual link this is used for vr so um, yeah basically the whole sort of cable nightmare that we've had with the vr headset so far all been rationalized into a single connection. You can see it right there. Uh, not really too much to say beyond this. Power inputs, we've got eight pin and six pin inputs there. So there we are, RTX 2080 in the hand. As a Founders Edition product, I'm really looking forward to how well it stands up in terms of acoustics and uh, the thermal throughput. So I'm gonna put that card right there. And through the wonder of editing, that bit of string is about to disappear. Okay, so next up, we're going to be taking a look at the RTX 2080 Ti. Now, once again, I have removed the protective seals. It's simply going to be a case of removing the top there. And, well, let's put that aside, give us some space. This time, no string, which is good. Uh, it does have the same protective plastic seal on it though that is making that racket. So let's take off the plastic and have a good look at the card itself. So it is indeed an RTX 2080 Ti and um, I have to admit that in terms of configuration versus the 2080 here, it's actually very, very similar. It looks as though it's the same basic design. So what do we got? Um, it's the same dual fan setup. It's uh, basically identical in almost every way. The port configuration, which you can see there, again, it's identical to the RTX 2080. And beyond that, there's not really that much difference between them at all. One thing that does stand out, obviously though, is that the power arrangement has changed. So yeah, you can see here that at the top of the card, we've got two eight pin power inputs this time. So yeah, this is obviously going to be a bit more of a power hungry card. But yeah, I mean, well, let's put the two cards side by side there. Very much of the same family, uh, pretty much identical actually, apart from, as I said, the power inputs there. Right, okay, so we have got the cards out of boxes. The unboxing is over. <laughs> um, it's time to move on to some details here. There's been a lot about Turing that we haven't been able to discuss and watching some of the commentary online, it's a little bit disheartening because um, uh, there is some negativity as there always is with a new product launch and as we are under embargo, we can't talk about it. We can't say, hey, hold on a second, but what about this? 
Uh, we can to a certain degree now. So there's a lot to digest here and to help me with this, I have made this a cheat sheet and here it is. Right, okay, so I'm gonna address one of the first issues that people have had with the RTX card, specifically that if you compare the CUDA core count versus Pascal and if you compare the CUDA core count versus Volta in the Titan V, it kind of looks as though we're sort of a little short there. I mean, it, are we gonna get that performance boost to basic rasterization uh, tasks or is Nvidia just concentrating too much on its AI and ray tracing? Well, I don't think that we're gonna have too many issues in terms of performance. Obviously the benchmarks will be coming uh, when we review the cards, but it all looks very plausible as to why this has happened. So the Turing SM is actually radically revamped versus Pascal and it is different to Volta as well. So to begin with, integer and floating point pipelines can now run concurrently. This couldn't happen on Pascal. This opens up a huge performance boost. Nvidia reckons that uh, being able to run those kind of tasks in parallel opens up a 30 to 50% efficiency advantage there, which is obviously fantastic. Secondly, historically, Nvidia has always uh, kind of experimented with its caches uh, on, on the GPU. And that's exactly what's happening with Turing. Bottom line here, the reason why Nvidia can have fewer CUDA cores than you're expecting is because there is apparently up to 50% improved performance per CUDA core. So that kind of puts things into context, right? Uh, they're also talking about memory bandwidth improvements. Now this is kind of key for me. When it comes to 4K gaming, it's a bit of a bandwidth monster. And my concern when I saw the specs for the RTX 2080 was that there wasn't a huge throughput advantage versus GTX 1080 Ti. In fact, it might even be slightly lower. So yes, Nvidia is claiming there are bandwidth improvements up to 50%, I believe, which uh, could address that. Obviously that is gonna vary according to the type of content being compressed. Uh, but yeah, obviously a lot of work has gone into that as well. A couple of things I do want to talk about. Uh, first of all, DLSS. So this is the most profound use of the tensor cores that we shall see in the short term. What's it doing? Okay, so you've probably seen these demonstrations where a low resolution image has been blown up into a high resolution image and the extra detail has been inferred. So we don't actually have any of that original detail in the image, but basically uh, the deep learning algorithm has access to a big bunch of imagery that it's seen in the past and it can kind of think, hey, this looks familiar. I'm gonna extrapolate out the detail there. So here's how I think DLSS works. Imagine a lower resolution image, uh, which is then put through that kind of super scaling technology. And what you end up with at the end is a, an image that looks similar to a TAA presentation. I mean, TAA, Temporal Anti-Aliasing, it's in a bunch of games at the moment. It's pretty much gonna become the standard there. And so the aim with DLSS is essentially to render at a lower resolution and then use uh, deep learning algorithms to extrapolate out the detail. Is it gonna work? We should have some demos of that in our review. Uh, I'm kind of optimistic based on what I saw at Gamescom and the performance boost where they had, you know, basically double the performance there between GTX 1080 Ti towards RTX 2080 Ti. So, you know, in theory, the performance boost here is extremely profound. If you can't tell the difference visually, if the quality holds up, you're not only getting the architectural improvements versus Pascal, you're also getting the advantages of DLSS on top. So I think this is hugely exciting. I can't wait to see what's going on there just to see how well it holds up. Okay, so next up, let's talk about ray tracing. Um, we've already seen some demos here. There are some concerns about performance. Uh, again, we'll be talking about that in the review. I have nothing to say about performance so far, except what I saw at Gamescom. Battlefield 5's performance at 1080p was north of 60 frames per second. It was low at 1440p and it didn't quite work at all at 4K. But here's the thing. DICE only had access to vinyl hardware for just two weeks. So yeah, we've got to look at this 
as a kind of first generation effort. And we've got to remember, first of all, how profoundly difficult the task of ray tracing is that we're getting any kind of real time result at all. But secondly, developers need time to bed in with the hardware. And I think that we're gonna see some fantastic stuff there. And I think we are, as my colleague Alex says, looking at the beginning of a new rendering paradigm there. RTX is basically a new tool that's been given to developers that they're just getting to grips with in the here and now. I'm predicting great things for this in the future. Okay, so let's move on. There's so much to Turing that we have to cover here. So where do we begin? Mesh shading. Okay, so I have made notes on this one. Um, essentially, we're going to get a massive CPU boost here, in theory, uh, because this new technique called mesh shading basically allows the GPU to do things like uh, LOD calculations, object culling, tasks which are typically done on the CPU and uh, this can now be done on the GPU. So yeah, typically there is like a draw call per object, uh, which is massively CPU intensive. If you've pushed up the extended draw distance in say GTA 5 or Watch Dogs 2, basically you're asking your GPU to push out massive levels of detail and stuff that you're not likely to see. So yeah, basically mesh shading rationalizes that entire LOD process. Uh, everything is refined to a draw call per object list. We saw an asteroid demo here, I only have a screenshot, but essentially this was handling LODs on the fly. It was, it was quite impressive to behold. Okay, so another technology I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, developers embrace, variable rate shading. So if you think back to Shadow Warrior 2, that had this fascinating technique where the edges of the screen were actually rendered at a lower resolution to the focal point, and this gave a pretty big performance win. Variable rate shading uh, can actually sort of split things into 16 pixel blocks and allocate shading resources basically according to how important it is to the visual makeup of the game. There can be huge performance improvements here and you can see this Forza Horizon shot here showing different pixel matrix configurations there used to basically render everything at variable rates. Pretty impressive. I also saw a Wolfenstein 2 demo uh, which used techniques called content adaptive shading, motion adaptive shading. So content adaptive shading basically allocates GPU resources according to, I guess, the significance of it in the scene. Uh, pretty impressive stuff. Motion adaptive shading. So, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, when pixels are in motion, the actual clarity of them, especially in games heavy in motion blur like Wolfenstein 2, the clarity of them obviously reduces. So, you know, why are we, you know, essentially rendering them at, massive levels of detail there if we can get away with a lower precision effect there. A big performance boost there, I think they were talking about um, 15 to 20 percent improvement on Wolfenstein 2, possibly higher because Wolfenstein 2 is already pretty performant on Turing. But yeah, if you think back to NVIDIA's RTX 2080 benchmarks released in the wake of the Gamescom announcement, you saw a big boost to Wolfenstein there, which kind of looked a bit iffy, but this is how it was done. You know, this is essentially using new features in Turing to get the job done. And uh, again, potentially really exciting stuff. Okay, yeah, let's talk about those benchmarks because obviously there were some results in there that were selective, to say the least. You might have noticed that there are a lot of results there were specific to HDR, which you might think is a bit iffy. I mean, you know, surely the performance boost should be the same on SDR and HDR, but Turing actually has native HDR tone mapping. So, you know, the operations required to tone map in Pascal no longer required. It's all done at the hardware level on Turing. I will be looking at that in the review, assuming I can get my FCAT workflow working on HDR. What do I expect in terms of performance boosts? So, uh, NVIDIA's um, technical marketing supremo, Tom Peterson, already on the record as saying 35 to 40%. I think that's a fairly reasonable expectation um, based on everything that we've seen here and based on the demos that we've seen. So yeah, that's what I would expect to see there. And you can see that on those RTX 2080 benchmarks that NVIDIA put out, there's quite a lot of titles that are resolving at that kind of level. But, you know, obviously the HDR stuff, the Wolfenstein stuff, the DLSS stuff, it was designed to show that there is a lot more in the Turing toolbox, which allows the architecture to pump out a lot more performance. 
And yeah, you know, I'll say it once again. I'm really looking forward to testing it out. So yeah, that's where I'm going to leave things for now. Please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Ring the bell for instant notifications when a new DF video drops. And if you're as excited about the future of gaming graphics as I am, then yeah, I would indeed ring that bell. And yes, of course, please do consider the DF Patreon in order to support the team more directly and yes, get access to pristine quality versions of every video that we produce. Uh, but that's all for me for now. Thanks so much if you made it to the end of this video and yep, I'll see you in the next one.